You've uh, written about the history of life on Mars. Like you said, you're kind of exploring that by looking at the lakes here. Um, do you think there's been life on Mars? Do you think there is life on Mars? Right. So when you're looking at the environment of Mars early on, it's fairly similar to that of early Earth. Never was exactly the same because Mars was always farther from the sun uh, than the Earth, right? So it was always a little cooler, but you have to imagine maybe the Arctic during the summer, that would be early Mars with a lot going on for it in terms of environment, very favorable to even life as we know it. So we don't know how fast life happened on Earth. There are signs right now showing that it might have actually originated only 200 million years after the crust cooled down. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, this still has to be verified, but that, that's the closest. And these are indirect evidence, like carbon left by the activity of life, not life itself. And there is a twist in the story for Mars, is that it seems that Mars came together as a planet faster than the Earth and had water earlier than the Earth. Uh, so it may be that Mars was habitable and might have seen the beginning of life earlier than the Earth. Um, so all of this is speculation. Obviously, we haven't found any evidence or solid evidence yet. Uh, I would say unambiguous evidence, but un unambiguous uh, evidence of life is going to be something uh, uh, interesting to prove because we don't know what life is, remember? So I always joke that the only way we would know that there is life on Mars if there was a rabbit jumping in front of the, of the rover. But we might be, you know, gathering, we have what we call a ladder of life detection, uh, which is that you have a series of uh, rungs that you, know, you need to go through that actually are not proving you that you discovered life, but are making um, the possibility that what you discovered was made only by the environment more and more improbable. So we are trying to prove the contrary, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what we have right now. And as far as I'm concerned, considering all the unknowns we have, I think there was as much chance that life originated on Mars that it did on Earth. And... Um, if it was at the surface, then it got in trouble after 500 million years because of the uh, disappearance of the magnetosphere, the loss of the magnetosphere and the atmosphere. But as we know, you know, life doesn't only stay in one place. As soon as it's out there, it's going to adapt, it's going to give itself more chance to survive. And that to me means that if life appeared, uh, I would say, it's still there and probably on the ground where it can be, you know, in an environment that's more stable. So I don't know how stability is good or not. It might not be so good, but they might be in a different type of metabolism through dormancy, you know, waiting for different climate cycles. And there is the fact that Mars changes a lot faster uh, than the Earth. And climate changes are a lot stronger in magnitude. So there might be a place on Mars. We know that there is a place on Mars deeper in the subsurface where temperature and pressure are good for liquid water to stay there. So these would be good places for a stable habitat over time, no matter what happens at the surface. But if uh, life is also caught between that deep zone and the surface, there is an active layer. There is a lot of ice in the subsurface of Mars. And when the climate changes, when uh, the obliquity goes beyond 30 degrees, then uh, at that point, you will have some activation of that zone. You have thawing of the ice. So all this region is reactivated. And maybe that's a way where you have pathways for life to move from the deep zone to closer to the surface. This is why I am one of those scientists who thinks that um, life might not be so far from the surface than we think. So we don't have to dig very far to find it. We probably won't. And, and the reason I'm- be I, so I, amazing. I, I'm thinking of that just because of this experience as well uh, of extreme environments. 
You know, you have to sit and look and listen, basically. The story of my life, if I want to understand where microbes are located on Mars, I have to become the microbe, right? <laughs> this is the thought experiment. Yeah. And if I want to understand uh -huh. where E.T. is, yeah. then I have to become E.T. So yeah. it's a big stretch. But in extreme environment, you sit in the desert for a while and you just, you know, try to understand where the wind's coming from, where the humidity, when it's showing up. And then you start to understand the patterns of, the th of those things. What are the useful signals that you need for survival? You need to know where water is, where the source of energy is going to be uh, uh, drawn from. You need to find shelters. And shelters don't mean that, for instance, you can have a water column of a lake or a river or whatnot, uh, or the ocean. It can be also a very thin layer of dust or it can be a translucent rock. And you see what we call endolith. These are the same cyanobacteria, but a different version of them. They live inside the rocks, inside those crystals, because they have the best of life. They are into translucent crystals so that they receive the light from the sun. They can do the photosynthesis, but there is enough of that crystal so that the nasty UV is being stopped. And they are in their little house. And um, when you are looking at the temperature within those rocks, they tend to make it toastier than the outside temperature. So there is a lot of thing going on. Um, so what I'm saying for Mars is that yeah, right now you don't have an atmosphere very much, 160 times thinner than the Earth. Six millibar is really uh, not much, but it's there. Um, but you still have a lot of UV, the short UV, like the nasty one, UVA, UVB, UVC, that can really mess up your DNA uh, and, and destroy it beyond repair. But as soon as you have a little alcove into a rock or a cliff, you know, I'd be looking at those places, but you have to understand Mars or any other planet for that matter at the level that matters for the microbe. And it, yes. so then <laughs> be you be one with the microbe. Be one with the microbes, uh, which means that we have lots of orbital data, which is good to understand habitability at the planet level or at the regional level. Yeah. But we have very little data right now that is very useful to understand habitability. Uh, at the scale that matters for the microbes at this point in time. So we need to, uh, to do a better job with that. My idea uh, is to you know, have arrays of environmental stations that could have a lot of benefits. One would be to give us that vision at the, for the microbes. That would be good for astrobiology. And second, so a, a collection of stations on Mars. On Mars, yeah. That, that collect, yeah. that give us a good map yeah. of the planet. Yeah, high resolution. We can do that regionally. And on top of that, so that's good for astrobiology, for the search for life on Mars. That's good about how to learn where microbes could be that can be a problem for contamination both ways. Uh, so that's good for planetary protection. And since those stations would have communication uh, capabilities on them that are excellent for human exploration because now not only you have weather stations all over the place that can tell your astronauts, you know, learn the pattern when it's a good time to go out or not go out, and also help them communicate uh, when they, they go uh, and do sorties. So there are a number of things you can do that can tell you um, lots of information.